on behalf of the Snail Neighborhood House and over 260 participants attending tonight's Mayor on Candidate Forum. Most importantly, I wish to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this extraordinary event. Elaine, take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. That was a very nice, warm welcome. So here we are. Welcome to the 2020 Sunnydale Mayor Candidate Forum. My name is Elaine Manley, and I am the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Cupertino and Sunnyvale. I'll be the moderator, as she mentioned. So we wanted to thank Sunnyvale neighbors of Arbor, including Melinda, also known as Snail, for hosting this forum and making this opportunity possible. So shall we begin? The forum will run approximately 90 minutes. It might go a little bit longer. We've got a lot of great questions, so uh, we will work our way through this. Um, let's see here, I want to check one thing. All right, good, we're ready to go. Before we get too deep into this, we wanted to um, just go over a little bit about Zoom. So you are all in listen-only mode, as you can see on the screen, and we will have the candidates be on video. You can submit questions. We did receive quite a few questions in the beginning uh, before the event began, and um, you're welcome to put more questions in. It's just my point is we do have a lot of questions already. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and you, if you just hover the bottom of the screen, there'll be Q&A. You type in your question and submit it, okay? Uh, let's see. If you have any technical issues, feel free to send an email to support at lwvcs.org, as you can see on the screen. Once again, this is being recorded. We hope to have the link to the recording available on our YouTube channel and our website, lwvcs.org, within the next couple of days. A little bit about the League. Um, 100 years now that we have been empowering voters and defending democracy. And we were founded in February of 1920, about six months before women won the right to vote and through the passage of the 19th Amendment, as you know. The League, so you know, never supports nor opposes any political parties nor candidates. We do have two separate corporations. This one that you're experiencing right now is our voter education. The other corporation that we have is for advocacy. And so if we ever go through uh, looking at an issue, studying it in depth and creating a position and taking action on that, that would be our advocacy arm. We do not mix the two. So this is the educational forum. Now, as far as how to vote, before I get into where to put your ballot, I wanted to point out when you receive your ballot, there will be an envelope that is addressed to you, and it's either going to have your first and last name, or it'll have your first, middle, and last name. Pay attention to that, because that's going to give you the clue of how you should sign the back of your, your return envelope. Make sure you date it. I would strongly encourage you to read the instructions a couple of times to make sure that you've actually completed the envelope, that's one of the key parts. Once you're ready to go, you can mail it. Um, you've probably heard a little bit in the news about delays in the mail, so you might want to put it in the mail at least by October 27th. Our thought is you might be better off just bringing your ballot. And there will be drop boxes by all of the libraries. There are also vote centers that you can take them to. We don't have polling places anymore but we do have vote centers and they're open for four days around election time. So three days before the day of election and you can find information about your vote center. Um, just so you know, they've got a URL for that too. Uh, the, our, our Santa Clara County has really done a great job on their website. This eservices.sccgov.org. If you go to that, it's got a whole bunch of information on the election. And in order to find your vote center, you type in your address and you press the go button and it will give you the locations of the vote centers nearest you, and it'll even show you how far they are. It even has the information on where are the drop boxes, the ballot drop boxes. So I just checked the site today, and it's not quite live. It says it's coming soon. Your ballots won't be arriving until October, so we have plenty of time, but we would encourage you to take a look at where the vote centers are gonna be. I'd say probably in another, oh, it's another week or two. Okay, so where to register? One of the first things, if you're not registered to vote, please do register to vote. You can see this URL, registertovote.ca.gov on your screen. It's a great site. It gives you the chance to register, but also check your registration status. 
there were quite a few people back in March that received ballots that were not for their party. And so if you go into this check your registration status, it will ask for your information and it will tell you what, what you're registered for. And if you don't like it and you want to change it, you still have time to go into the register to vote now and just re-register. The other thing we wanted to point out is you'll notice this retry. If, if you put in your information and get the retry, it means there's something wrong in the system and we would encourage you to re-register again. Um, once again, pointing out you can register to vote even on election day. That is a unique thing for California, but you can wait that long. Please don't wait that long. It's much better to do this in advance. You've got plenty of time, so do please take a moment and uh, register to vote if you're not registered and check the registration status. So there's a few things on the ballot you might have might have noticed, and um, we do have a fabulous website. It's called VotersEdge.org, and it's a great joint venture from MapLight, which looks at all of the money behind the candidates and the ballot ballot measures. It also has all of the fact-checked information from the league at the state level, and they compile everything so that when you go to VotersEdge.org and you type in your address, it will pull up your ballot, which is wonderful because it's just relevant to you. You don't get a lot of extras. It's just what's on your ballot. And once again, you'll see all the way from president down to local level information. Um, you will see the ballot measures. You'll see more information on the election and how to register to vote and voting information um, of all kinds. So it's a very handy resource. We would encourage you to check out the site. We also have the uh, QR code on here as well that you can capture. One last piece we wanted to provide for you is the nonpartisan election information. One of the key things when you vote is you wanna be informed, but you wanna be informed with the facts. So there are a lot of organizations that are working extremely hard to make sure you can find the facts about what you are voting about. Our sites, of course, we have the local level as well as the state level, Ballotopedia, Voters Edge, LAO stands for the Legislative Analyst Office, SOS is our Secretary of State, and so on. So take a moment, do a screenshot, or take a picture with your phone. It's a great resource for you that you'll want to go to once you get your ballot. All right, so now we get the fun stuff. I want to introduce our candidates, but I want to give a little bit of information first. So it is the first time voters can directly elect our Sunnyvale mayor. And we do have three candidates running. This is another page I'd like you to take a moment and screenshot or jot down the notes. We have Michael Bowman with his URL, so you can get more information on him. Larry Klein with his URL. And Nancy Smith with her information. So I will stop the screen and I'll bring them up. So we'll bring them up on, I'll announce them. Michael Goldman, welcome. Thank you very much, pleasure yes. to be here. Thank you. Next, Larry Klein. Good evening, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, welcome. And Nancy Smith. Hi, Hi. good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us, we appreciate all of you coming. Um, now, if I may, just take a moment, I wanna explain the candidates have agreed to a set of ground rules for the forum and we're going to post questions and then we'll designate response times. It's gonna be 90 seconds to answer the first and the last question, but 60 seconds for all the questions in the middle. If I could have our timer show his box, the timer will have a separate box as you'll be able to see. And so all of us will be able to know as your time is winding down, 30 seconds, then 15 and then the stop and you'll rest on the timer normally. So each time you will reset the timer. So thank you for doing that, Bruce. These are uh, our timer extraordinary. So the questions for the forum were gathered by email in advance and we will start with those questions. We will do our best to take questions from the audience. So once again, you can go into the Q&A and type in your question. I do have some volunteers that are monitoring the questions and they'll do their best to consolidate them by topic and get them over to me. So let's, let's learn more about our candidates. We once again, thank you for participating in our forum. The speaking order for this first question was chosen randomly in advance, and we will start with Nancy Smith, then we'll hear from Michael Goldman, and then from Larry Klein. So you have 60, sorry, 90 seconds for this first question. And the question is, what are your qualifications and what do you hope to accomplish as mayor of Sunnyvale? 90 seconds. Thank you. Right after I was elected, I hosted office hours and I was surprised 
uh, by the people who came. They were mostly teenagers. So I saw how hungry they were to express their concerns and to be heard. And I mentored them on how to advocate for themselves and how to articulate the ways that um, local policy decisions impact their lives. So now our city is facing uncertainty. Uh, this year with COVID, many of us have cared for a parent, our children, ourselves under trying circumstances. Even when even strong, healthy people strain to stay here, it is especially a concern to think about the difficulties that vulnerable people face. So many in our city are struggling to stay healthy and calm and fed. My qualifications as mayor are that I view the whole of what it means to live here. And I'm the person most ready to pull us all together and help us overcome our challenges. We are a city with many income levels, ages, many cultures and ethnicities and uh, people who have had it pretty easy and people who are having a hard time. My vision is that we need a Sunnyvale for all, a Sunnyvale that's livable and sustainable. People come first and that's why I'm the people's choice for mayor. Thank you, Nancy. Michael Goldman. Uh, th thank you. Um, a little of my history. Um, at age 19, I was serving with US forces in Vietnam. Uh, one of my tasks was to log the death count for the day. That burned into my mind that the world needed to be healed and that it was my responsibility, as with many others, to, to contribute to that healing. So when I got, got out and went to the university, I tutored kids in the ghetto nearby. Uh, later on, I worked with uh, tutoring students in, on the Indian reservation near another university. I worked in political campaigns for candidates who I thought could make the world a better place. As a dad, I did what dads do. I coached and refereed soccer. I, I, I got, became president of the soccer uh, club and made uh, soccer basically year round. They added spring and summer soccer so kids could play year round all the year round. I joined the, later joined the uh, Sunnyvale Pension Reform Group uh, to uh, alert the city council of uh, something that is a, a crisis, which is a financial crisis, which is gonna hit all cities in 10 or 20 years in California. Uh, to get them uh, get uh, some money set aside, which has happened. Uh, when I learned of plans later on uh, to take let a developer take over two thirds of the uh, Civic Center, I co-founded with another uh, friend a, a group to stop that. We joined with those uh, trying to fight the um, uh, sale of the Rainer Park Activity Center, where my kids and others had played for so long, and I uh, and I want to keep that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And Larry Klein. Sure. Hi, I'm Sunnyvale Mayor Larry Klein, and I'm the most qualified candidate, being our mayor for the last 20 months and helping manage the city's response to a hate crime in 2019, the current COVID-19 pandemic, and racial and social unrest. I have shown the leadership required to be our first directly elected mayor and lead the city out of our current crisis. I've been one of the most inclusive mayors that Sunnyvale has ever had, and I've worked hard to raise Sunnyvale's regional voice, especially during the pandemic. Most importantly, I have made our residents feel safe and helped build community during difficult times. For the last six months, I have also personally done everything I could for Sunnyvale's residents and businesses. And for the next four years, I wanna to continue to be my successful um, self as council member and mayor in making Sunnyvale and our region more livable. I want to continue improving transportation options, adding to our housing options, pushing our environmental goals, and finishing Sunnyvale's downtown. But it's critical that the first directly elected mayor showed leadership to bring the community together. The mayor needs to set the tone and reassure residents, and the directly elected mayor will not change the successful model of governments and fiscal responsibility that, we have, that served our city so well. I'm confident that Sunnyvale will emerge from the current crisis as a stronger community. And as your mayor, I will work every day to make sure that that happens. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're ready to get into our questions and these are 60 second responses. We will start with Michael. And the question is, what is the role of the city in recovery, resilience and regeneration 
as we deal with the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, that is an uh, excellent question. Um, and the answer is we don't really know what the, uh, what's going to happen. The, uh, we have unprecedented unemployment. We have um, the worst medical situation in over 100 years. Uh, anyone who tells you that they know what the economy is going to be like or what the health situation will be like in uh, next year or in two years or in three years uh, is, is simply not, you know, not clued in. Uh, so what the city has to do is basically retrench. We have to uh, keep things stable. We have to uh, not cut back on public safety because there are going to be a lot of people under a lot of stress. There will be increases in homelessness, uh, increase in domestic violence as people uh, uh, experience financial stress. And we have to be ready for that. We can't uh, go paying uh, you know, extravagant amounts of money for a new city, civic center. Um, otherwise, we have to uh, look for, sorry, my time's up. Thank, Thank you. you. Larry? Yes, so definitely we're entering a new normal and you know how we respond to that from a city standpoint is critical. You know, when, when the shelter in place started, Sunnyvale City Council uh, approved a, an eviction moratorium that went beyond the county's measures. And, you know, over that time and over the last six months, we've actually donated uh, consider considerable funds, about a million dollars to help our needy residents, uh, nonprofits, and our small businesses. And how we continue to do that uh, is becomes critical. And it's advocating at a federal level, at a state level, at a county level to make sure that things, you know, get funded. It's also taking basically a very close look at our budget as we move forward, what services we provide, what projects we can postpone in order to make sure that we have enough runway to meet that recovery. I've been co-chair of a recovery council for all the mayors, for 30 plus mayors and 60 plus businesses here in the Bay Area. And part of that has been working for a plan for what our cities do as well as our businesses. Thank you, and Nancy. Yeah, thank you. We are. We have planned for this downturn. Uh, the city has a is required by charter to balance our budget out by 10 years. And to do that, we plan 20 years ahead. And part of our strategy is to have a prudent reserve. So we were able to react uh, to the downturn by cutting a few services, but we kept employees and many, most of the services that we provide. And the council has directed staff to check in on a quarterly basis to see where we stand and to manage carefully how we respond and to take further action as needed. Uh, the, we need to work to stimulate businesses and look at ways we can continue to help our residents to weather this crisis. Thank you. All right, so our next question is on housing, and it says one way to ensure housing supply increases to support office growth is to require the housing to be built first before new commercial development is allowed. Mountain View has this requirement in the East Wisman precise plan. The question is, do you support this as a way to prevent rapid office development from outstripping housing development? And where would this policy make sense in Sunnyvale? And the first one to answer will be Larry. Yeah, so, so definitely um, tying the, the, the construction of office space to housing makes sense. Uh, that being said, you know, you, you look at where it could actually be used in the city and there's very few st specific plans where that really makes a lot of sense. You know, definitely as we're looking at conceivably adding housing to Moffett Park, but uh, is one possibility, definitely Lawrence Station and conceivably El Camino Real also. We're, we're currently evaluating adding housing to almost all of our specific plans. And I think that's critical, you know, doing that tie. That being said, when we're, when we're building that office space, we're also taking housing mitigation fees that we take directly in order to fund affordable housing. So even, even with that, without those ties and existing plans that are already there, we still have that money that's collected in order to help affordable housing production right here in the city. And I think that's also a critical portion of this, of this ratio. Thank you. Nancy. So 
we recently did this with the downtown specific plan. We had development agreements with, um, with all of the, um, well, we went through two uh, developers and one of them, we stipulated that we wanted them to build housing first. So they had to reach a certain level of housing before they could start on the offices. So yes, I support it because we just did it. And uh, we can look at other um, large scale um, projects. So the ones that come to mind are basically Moffat Park, if we decide to put housing there. So I, I do support that as a way to bootstrap some housing supply that is sorely needed. Thank you. Michael. Uh, <laughs> We, um, Sunnyvale's pretty much built out. Uh, if one building goes up, another has to come down first. Um, I've argued very uh, extensively that uh, there are numerous state uh, and federal agencies which have said building in Moffat Park is a recipe for disaster. Uh, even a foot or two of sea level rise, uh, which is projected to happen within the next uh, 30 years, will simply swamp the place. It'll cost a fortune to buy out all the the residences will be which will be swamped and all the housing um, will have to be uh, bought, bought up and torn down. Uh, Lawrence uh, Station Lab is an option. Uh, the, the question assumes that people work where they live and they don't. Uh, only less than 10% of the population of Sunnyvale uh, works in Sunnyvale and it's going down. People commute over and over uh, everywhere. Uh, they commute from uh, Fremont to here and they commute from here to Fremont. Uh, so the idea, so we, yeah, housing uh, goes with um, development, but uh, we, what can we, we, I have to stop. I'm sorry. I could go on for an hour. Thank you. All right. So our next question is a little bit more into the jobs and housing. Um, as you know, it's a very key issue for our city. So the Moffat Park specific plan could dramatically change the jobs housing balance in Sunnyvale what would be the best jobs housing balance in that plan for Sunnyvale? And what about the concerns that it is a former marshland and could flood? If the city were to allow building there, it might be sued. So how, how much risk do you see with that? So the first question, once again, what would be the best jobs to housing ratio? And then the second addressing the actual location of the Moffat plan, Moffat Park specific plan. All right, so our first person to answer will be Nancy. So we have a general plan and um, part of that is the loot, the land use, land use and transportation element. And currently the, the uh, ratio that's in the loot is 1.7. Um, some people, um, myself included, think it's more ideal to have something closer to 1.5, but the city has approved um, 1.7. So we look at the housing all over the city and one of the reasons that we're looking at housing in Moffat Park is because uh, the state requires us to build a certain amount of housing with a variety, for a variety of income levels. And we are not keeping up with that. And the state is about to uh, add uh, like three times as much. So that is kind of um, impelling us to look where it may not make sense. And we may decide it may not make sense, but we're looking at it. Thank you. Larry. Yeah, so I definitely think that, you know, the ratio could be a little bit less, but, but if you go back into the, like the 1970s, our ratio was actually a lot more. It was, it was about three to one uh, during, you know, during the heyday of, of the defense industry. And so as opposed to 1.7 where it is now, uh, conceivably, you know, uh, adding housing into Moffitt, uh, Moffitt Park is a possibility. You know, there are other locations, other specific areas, specific plan areas around the city. That being said, you know, you look at what's being ha what's happening in North Bayshore, you know, it, housing can be built. Conceivably, it has to be built above ground. You know, the, the first layer is is conceivably parking. You know, there are options that, that when you're building a floodplain, what has to be done for housing. And so, you know, there are things that can be done and could be done for, from a Moffat Park standpoint, even though conceivably, we do actually have to look at sea level rise and working with the Army Corps of Engineers and what we're going to do with that sea level rise. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Can't believe we're having this conversation. We had a knockdown, dragout fight, um, a very um, 
a lot of people showed up about four years, almost four years ago, when I, first year I was on, we were on the council, about that ratio. And uh, we got letters from the state and um, Sierra Club and everyone saying 1.4 is where we should go. Uh, we ended up, uh, and that's what I was advocating for, we ended up with a higher ratio. Uh, the state is uh, requiring a certain number of things, but they have no enforcement. They can't force the city to build because the city doesn't build stuff. They can't force developers to build because developers build wherever they want and they don't build where they don't want. Uh, Moffat Park, uh, building in that Moffat Park is a form of climate denial. It's kind of like saying, yeah, this climate is changing, but it's not going to do anything. Um, I think it's crazy. I, uh, we, there are other places to build. The other thing is, if we build in Moffat Park, it's going to gentrify that. Rents in the mobile home parks will go skyrocketing. I do not think that's a good idea. A lot of people will suffer from that. Uh, so um, I'm opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next question is on justice. What will you do as mayor to eliminate any racial and social injustice in our city? And we'll start with Larry. Sure. So one of the things after the murder of George, George Floyd that I did was take the mayor's pledge to make sure that we look and take a, an active look at reforming our police, but more importantly, going through a process of, of hearing from our residents, their concerns, and started this evening out with a, a unity event that was for our Spanish speaking community, but we've had uh, basically community unity events with LGBT community, our youth community, and soon a police uh, round table. You know, from my standpoint, taking an active social and racial lens for everything that we do from a city is critical. You know, what we've done as far as trying to deal with, with the services in North Sunnyvale, you know, bringing in the Lakewood Branch Library, looking at, you know, what we're doing as far as transparency from our public safety department is critical. You know, I, I'm very proud of what our public safety department does and what our, what our unique model which is shown to actually have a better safety in, our, in all of our cities. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Uh, I, I think it's nice that we had this uh, kind of listening session. Uh, what I would like is a regular um, police uh, liaison commission. Uh, we have a planning commission, we have a library uh, board, board, we have other, all these commissions. Uh, police is a big part of our, our city, uh, and people, residents have questions, and they, they have, uh, you know, questions about interactions with uh, police and, f and fire. They're all trained in both. Um, so uh, having a one-time uh, or a couple of times, um, you know, in response to a, a national uh, event is, is okay. It's nice, but we need to make it a regular thing because where, if you have a question about police, uh, whatever the question, where do you go? Right now, basically, you have to ask the city council. That's not optimal. We need to have a regular thing. I would call it police light liaison, not police oversight, because oversight sounds kind of nanny-ish, uh, but uh, something to allow citizens and the police to interact on an equal basis. Uh, that's my idea. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. That is a tall order, because um, human nature is um, something that it would be nice to change as a city council member or a mayor what we can do is address the effects of it and teach children and young people about how to recognize it and avoid it. So for example, uh, I've been working with some of the organizers of the Black Lives Matter parade to really be able to state the problems that they see, to be able to respond to the DPS proposals for how to address racial injustice and inequality in the city. I think we heard um, many of the council members listened uh, to what the community concerns were. And um, it's uh, things like police in schools and unfair treatment, perceived unfair treatment from uh, police officers. So we can also work with experts to make sure our police force knows how not to be uh, unjust or um, unequal. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so our next question um, is about the budget. So in light of the COVID-19 and the loss of revenue, what city projects currently in the pipeline do you think need to be cut back in order to reduce future expenses to offset the lack of income in our city? And we will start with Michael. Well, I've um, obviously, 
uh, what they call the civic center modernization would be first on my chopping block. Uh, there's this idea you may have heard of, don't spend money you don't have. Uh, and we would have to go into, with the current plans, we would be incurring $150 million in debt, on, of which um, I'm told uh, by the city manager, there'd be $92.5 million in interest paid. Uh, if it goes over, there's any cost, sort of cost overrun, uh, that, uh, that will have to come out of the borrowing. Uh, there's, if we have spent all the money we have in reserve. So um, that's got to stop. We, we, we're okay. Uh, we, staff has actually gone down. We'll probably lose some more staff. Uh, we don't need the space. Uh, that's the first thing to go. I would wa I want to keep the public safety. Uh, we're going to have, they're going to be under a lot of stress with the fires and the, you know, the home the increased homelessness and everything else. So those are my uh, feelings. Thank you. Nancy. Yes. Oh, sorry. We, this is a rebuttal. So they each get a 30 second rebuttal. Nancy, you're using yours right now, correct? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, we need to be realistic about the Civic Center project, not overstate the costs and not ignore the many benefits that the project brings. Downturns are perfect time to do civic projects. The way that the city's finance projects means that we have funds on hand and the opportunity for, to provide local jobs for local workers uh, when for-profit companies may be pulling back. Also, it won't leak energy like the current one is doing. Thank you. Okay, so then back to the question. You are next up on the budget. Do you need me to repeat the question or do you feel like you have it? Um, it would be nice to repeat it, yes. I understand. <laughs> I understand. All right, so in light of the COVID-19 and the loss of revenue, what city projects currently in the pipeline do you think need to be cut back in order to reduce future expenses to offset the lack of income in the city? Yeah, so we have uh, in our budget many different funds and many different funding sources. And we have um, taken a big hit in terms of our general fund. Uh, we lost sales tax, quite a lot of sales tax and um, uh, transit occupancy taxes because people aren't staying in hotels. So that's impacted our services quite a bit. Um, and we did trim some things like, um, unfortunately, sidewalk repair and tree trimming. Um, the other projects are funded differently and I don't see any need to cut anything yet. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be keeping a close eye on the budget and getting quarterly updates on, on where we stand. So um, I think one of the best things we can do is support local businesses and keep our sales taxes up as much as we can. Thank you. Larry. Sure. And so as far as the Civic Center, I, I definitely think that, you know, we've made that decision as far as moving forward with that. I think that, you know, this is conceivably the best time to go out as far as rates are concerned and, you know, putting local workers to work, creating a lead platinum net zero uh, city hall. That being said, there are projects conceivably and services that can be postponed. You know, we're, we're having a long, the good thing from a Sunnyvale standpoint is we have a 20 year budget. We have a 10 year plan. You know, we're, we're looking, we're looking at conceivably postponing renovations at parks or, you know, much like we did, we took, you know, uh, immediate action this year to postpone uh, replacing sidewalks, tree, tree trimming from at least a contracting standpoint. We still have city, city staff providing those critical services. That being said, as we're moving forward, you know, being good stewards of our budget is a critical thing that council and the mayor needs to do. And, you know, our, currently our property taxes are actually coming in higher than expected. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next topic is COVID in schools. How would you support school-aged children with their need for low-cost internet that there is equity in education during and after COVID-19? What would be your approach to citywide Wi-Fi for all, since basic Wi-Fi could be ubiquitous and free for all? And we'll start with Nancy, please. Sure. Um, I have been reading up on fiber and 5G and we in the US are way behind other continents and other countries. South Korea has um, quite a big uh, infrastructure for that. Uh, there are other cities 
in the U.S. who have invested in fiber optic networks as a municipal utility. So that helps to keep costs low and the um, level of service high. I think there is some merit to looking at that. It's, it would take a lot of rethinking of how we um, operate that as a city, but um, otherwise you've got students in parking lots trying to do their schoolwork. It's just untenable and unjust. So uh, I think we do need to look seriously at uh, fiber optics and 5G throughout the city. Thank you. Uh, Michael, please. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, no one's more in favor of education, uh, supporting education than I am. Uh, the U.S. Census tells me that basically around 90% of Sunnyvale homes have Wi-Fi of some sort, uh, internet connection, I mean. Um, so we're looking at about 10% that don't. Uh, the schools uh, get federal money to help uh, poor kids. Um, basically, uh, there's about mm, roughly 25, 30% of uh, school kids are on free and reduced lunch, which is an indicator of uh, financial uh, issues. Uh, so if we could work with the schools, uh, we, can, uh, we can just extend it to a few, a few people. Uh, there are some, a lot of big tech companies that are you know, very generous, uh, some of them uh, with their uh, help, and we can enlist their aid in, in getting uh, the, the remainders. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but um, you know, I'm sure we can get it. It's only, as I said, it's 10% of the city. Talking about a few thousand kids, I don't think we, I think we can afford to help them along with the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Yeah, so, so during COVID-19, I've you know, definitely been working with the superintendents of each of the school districts and making sure that the children in need that needed Wi-Fi or Chromebooks actually had them. And the school districts have been, you know, able to meet that need to a certain degree, but it's also been advocating with a company like Google that, that ended up donating $100,000 to Sunnyvale Education Foundation to help with Wi-Fi hotspots and Chromebooks for those school districts to make sure that our students actually were able to do that access. And from a city standpoint, it was working with city staff and the city manager to make sure that, you know, residents can now go to the library and check out a Wi-Fi hotspot, a Chromebook. You know, it's providing those services, you know, from, from those to those that need it. And in looking at the long term, you know, we had a study issue that, that didn't get funded that we need to bring back is providing Wi-Fi in each of our parks because we have a lot of parks spread throughout the city. And that's one way that we can at least get immediate access spread throughout the communities for those in need of that access. Thank you. All right, we're on to our next question. Our next topic is development. And so there's a little preface and then the question. There are demands for more commercial properties as well as more residential properties, especially high density housing for low income families. At the same time, there are people demanding to preserve the Sunnyvale that we have today instead of ever more and bigger and taller buildings. Where do you stand with regards to future growth of Sunnyvale? More commercial growth? More residential growth? Maintaining the status quo? We will begin with Michael. Uh, development's the big issue. Um, if, if we had a nice grid street uh, pattern, you have a lot of straight lines with uh, streets going all the way through north and south on east and west, uh, we would be growing. We would, uh, they're basically, we could, we could uh, turn into Manhattan. We're about the same uh, square miles, 24. Uh, but we don't. We have a lot of cul-de-sacs. We have a lot of streets that I live, like I live on, that go nowhere. Uh, streets, we really can't widen the streets. We don't have any uh, decent subway system or anything equivalent. VTA is constantly cutting routes because uh, ridership is going down. Uh, so there are limits to growth, and the limit is not how well you build. It's how you get people in and out. Uh, the roads can only uh, goes, uh, uh, handle so much, and once you're over, over that, you're in gridlock. Um, building higher costs a lot of money. We just authorized a seven-story building, uh, subsidized housing for low income, $1,000 a square foot. Standard two-bedroom apartment, it's gonna cost $750,000. That's bare bones. Thank you. Thank you. Larry? Sure, so you know, from a ratio standpoint, it's, we're constantly doing infill, uh, both from a commercial standpoint and a housing standpoint. So, you know, building 
trans in transportation oriented development from either the commercial standpoint or housing is critical. So we're increasing that density near our transportation centers. That being said, you know, we have a large percentage of single family, single family homes throughout our city. And one of the things that we can do is add ADUs or conceivably converting some of those homes into duplexes. You know, sprinkling small units throughout the city helps that ratio at the end of the day. You know, for, for what we do from a city standpoint, you know, we zone. And one of the things that we need to look at is, is continued up zoning of certain areas, you know, near our Caltrain stations, near our light rail, you know, that it is a mixture of transportation for both the commuters and for the residents and making sure that the quality of life of those people in the surrounding communities is maintained as we add that density in our city. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, so uh, we um, again reference the um, general plan, which does set forth the ratio. And we are also um, part of ABAG, the Association for Bay Area Governments. Uh, they've put together a plan Bay Area program with what they call plan development areas. And we have several of those areas in Sunnyvale. I believe there's seven of them, maybe eight now with the Moffat Park. And uh, essentially it's adding housing and density along transit corridors. So if you hear about downtown, if you hear about um, Lawrence Station, if you hear about the residential um, plans going along uh, El Camino, that is in hopes that we can absorb um, and, and hopefully get people to use public transit more as we add density and to um, keep the balance that we need for enough housing to, to make room for our, our workers at whatever income level they, they have. Thank you. All right, our next topic is City Hall. So why is the new city hall important to residents and how will we afford it in light of the COVID hit to city revenue? And I think this has been touched on so you'll get a chance to expand on it more. The first person to answer will be Larry. Sure. So, you know, we, the city hall has been, you know, a series of decisions from city council. And one of the things that, that it doesn't really make sense is to rehash those decisions. We've made some great decisions as far as what the needs are. Uh, as far as creating additional open space and creating a, a net zero lead platinum building, which is conceivably the first city hall of that type in the nation. And so from our standpoint, you know, and, and sitting, in, sitting in the uh, city hall now uh, where, you, where, you know, it's cold in the wintertime, it's too hot in the summertime, there are definite, definite issues with, with the power, you know, this is, it's time for us to take a step forward, you know, not having city employees uh, double up in cubicles. There's all kinds of issues with, with the current design. And so creating that new city hall is, is a focus. And what, we, what we're finally going to be able to do is go out for bid and get that project started. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. It's a point of pride. Uh, for the city and also part of uh, safety of our employees. I don't know how many, I would encourage um, people who are maybe hesitant about it to, uh, when it's safe to do so, go visit the Nova offices. And I'm sensitive to mold. Um, those offices are literally moldering as are the financial offices. So we need to do something. The city clerk is in a trailer um, what kind of image are we putting forward as a city in Silicon Valley that our city clerk is in the trailer? Um, we have been saving the money. We've been doing years of public process on this and we have the funds uh, and it's a good time to put people to work during a downturn and get this uh, great new civic center that's uh, energy efficient on the road. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the um, Aspinall Federal Building in Grand Junction, Colorado, is roughly uh, sort of kind of uh, the size of our current city hall. It was built in 1915, over 100 years ago. On its 100th anniversary, it was um, uh, up upgraded and is now a net zero building. Um, it took $15 million, one five. Uh, we're talking, um, I have a, it's in, in the budget, uh, $10 million a year uh, for, for, for debt service. 
uh, for the next, uh, I don't know, 25 years, I think, uh, on the uh, how much money we'll have to borrow for this. Uh, I have a letter from the city manager saying it's uh, $93 million in interest on a $150 million loan. Um, I've, if you don't tear down a building just because there's a little mold, and the city clerk is not in a trailer, he's in a temporary building. Uh, my kids were in a temporary building at uh, you know, their school, and that temporary building is still there 20 years later. Uh, if you have mold, get rid of the mold. How hard is that? Uh, this is, we're in really critical financial situation. Unemployment is the highest since the 30s. We can't, we can't afford this, really. Thank you. All right, our next question is about small business. What are your plans to support small businesses to revitalize and encourage the life of the city beyond the downtown boundaries? And we will begin with Nancy. I have been looking into uh, various techniques. Um, one of the things is that we could uh, support like Santa Clara does, shifting more businesses to worker, cooperative, worker, worker owned cooperatives or even look maybe at more consumer owned cooperatives to help uh, struggling businesses. A lot of uh, business owners are older and are, are leaving their businesses because they can't find buyers but the workers are invested in the business and maybe the a choice to um to look at that so uh, i'd be working with advocates for that i've been working with advocates for that we also have a great opportunity to invest in uh, green recovery we've got uh, we have a need for people who can install heat pump water heaters uh, and do various other jobs relating to the industry with waste reduction and so on so there's many opportunities and we need to pursue them vigorously. Thank you. Larry. Yeah, so during the pandemic, you know, I've been personally uh, doing my mayor's restaurant project, reaching out to now more than 150 different restaurants, going to them once a day, highlighting, you know, highlighting a restaurant, a business owner within the city. And, you know, I'm actually very, over, I'm, I'm actually very proud to see a lot of our businesses have maintained. We're not seeing a lot of businesses close. Definitely our larger, larger companies are, are laying off staff, but from a small business standpoint, which is the heart and soul of Sunnyvale, we're actually making it through the pandemic right now without, you know, without a big downturn. You know, I've, I've heard of other cities where, where they've already lost you know, 30 or 40% of the businesses. We've actually had businesses opening up in the middle of, of a pandemic. So from my standpoint, you know, I think we are pushing our way through, you know, from a Sunnyvale Council standpoint, we did a small business grant program, giving them five, 10, $15,000 to help them through this. And all we can do is helping them go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Only one rebuttal. I'm sorry, Nancy, there's only one oh, rebuttal. Oh. Yeah, thank, thank you. Michael. Um, well, every small business uh, is a little different. Uh, the businesses on Murphy Street have different issues than a, a business on a mall on um, um, El Camino or one of the neighborhoods. Uh, I think what we, the best we can do is uh, provide a little money and a lot of publicity for some of these places because people have kind of gotten out of the habit of going to a lot of them. A lot of them are restaurants. Uh, th those have suffered the, probably the most, but other, other places have too. Uh, we, we have always spent a certain amount of money on downtown, uh, getting people out there. As the downtown uh, improvements uh, go forward, uh, they probably will need less of that. And we could direct that money towards some of the other uh, neighborhood uh, businesses and help them get some publicity and maybe have a, like a little jazz band for some ball on a Saturday and get people just aware of where they are and that they are back in business and and they, uh, we, we should get, uh, we should use our local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next topic is on parks. How will you ensure that residents in Sunnyvale have equitable access to safe and enjoyable parks and open space? And do you think we need a ballot measure to require land use decisions to go to the voters to protect these types of things? So we will start with Larry. Sure. So, you know, from, from a council standpoint, many years ago, we prioritized the renovation and the creation of new parks. You know, in the last uh, year, we've actually created and, and made, a made a development decision with a developer on a two acre park at the old Corn Palace, as well as a 6.5 acre park 
at the old AMB location along Duane. You know, so we are committed to adding parks throughout the city. You know, and, and in the last few years, we've had Swiegel's Park, we've had Weiser Park, you know, we've had Seven Seas Park added to the, the amount of open space that, that makes it equitable across the community. And, and moving forward, you know, it's like, it's making sure that we are committed from a council standpoint to create those parks, to renovate those parks, and make sure that, that we don't need, in my mind, another Measure M as far as the sale or rental of, of parkland. You know, it's, it, that's, that was decided four years ago. And ultimately, I think, you know, it's not needed from a city standpoint. Thanks. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, I was a big proponent of Measure M. In fact, uh, much of the reason I ran was to get Measure M more publicity. Everyone else that was running was opposed to it, so I wanted to be the one <clears throat> up on the, all those forums we go to uh, saying yes. Um, we, we almost passed, 320 votes short. Um, uh, thanks to that, we, we've started getting a lot more parks. Uh, before, I made a big issue of it when I was running. We hadn't built a park, tiny, tiny little one in Swagels Park, uh, for years, and now we're adding them all, all the time. So I think I've, I've had some influence. As for, now right now, uh, it's a, it takes five to two uh, to, to uh, take a city park or open space and uh, put it up for sale basically. Uh, that's, if the developers, if they want a park, they can, they can get, uh, they can back five candidates easy. Uh, so we do need public, uh, you know, public vote on that. Uh, and that's you know, basically my position. Thank you. We have a rebuttal from Larry. 30 second rebuttal. This is your one and only. Okay. Yes. So from, from a development standpoint, you know, the concept that the council would, would sell our public open space to, to a developer is, I think, disingenuous. You know, I think that the residents, you know, would, would be up in arms if that was actually the case. And, and moving forward, you know, it's, it's having those development agreements and having those developers actually dedicate parkland to the city is, is a long-term goal and part of our council priorities. So I don't think that, you know, Measure M is, is needed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so back to our question. Nancy, you're next. I think that the key point that uh, the question raises is the equitable access. Uh, we, in our active transportation plan, we noticed that uh, certain areas of the city do not have equitable access to bike and pedestrian um, infrastructure. So I do think that the, um, the measures that the city has put into place to add parks is fabulous. I was actually neutral on Measure M, so I think... Uh, Council member Goldman smokes in this spoke a tiny little bit, but um, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to a measure, but I'm not necessarily going to prioritize it as something council should do. Um, I do think that we ought to look seriously at how livable various neighborhoods are and do what we can to increase um, to increase services in areas where they're needed, including parks. Thank you. All right, our next topic: redistricting. So Sunnyvale will have to redraw the maps after the census. Do you support or oppose an independent redistricting commission and why? And if not an independent commission, how do you ensure fairness, quality, and in-depth understanding on how to lead this process? And we'll start with Michael, please. That's an easy one. Absolutely, I support an independent commission. I supported it before, I support it now, I support it in the future. Um, there is too much politics uh, in this kind of thing. People, um, the drawing of lines um, in our your earlier uh, go round on, on uh, going to districts was, was uh, filled with basically complaints about this line being a little over here, a little, that line a little over there. Uh, this is the kind of thing that someone who wants to keep another, uh, if a majority wants to keep one council member from running again, they could do that if they, if they have control, or they could make sure that another councilman has no opponents. Uh, that's that's why we really, really need an independent commission. So no question, yeah. Thank you. Nancy. Would you repeat the question, please? Ab absolutely. So Sunnyvale will have to redraw the map after the census. Do you support or oppose an independent redistricting commission and why? 
And if not an independent commission, how do you ensure fairness, quality, and in-depth understanding on how to lead this process? I think that uh, council looked at various, um, we contemplated this at some degree and we decided to postpone it until after this election, uh, until after the census. And um, I, I support in concept the um, idea of an independent uh, commission, but on the other hand, there's, I'm not sure that, that Sunnyvale was quite set up for it. So there were some other options floated about mostly independent and they would come up with two options um, for council's final approval. And so there, there are some, um, I'm not sure what the mechanism would be to, um, to actually select the members. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things to be considered and I look forward to, um, I guess, directing the debate as, a, as mayor. Okay, thank you. Larry. Yeah, so, so I definitely support an independent uh, group that, that does look at uh, redistricting. You know, ultimately, it's, it's how that feeds into council and feeds into that final decision. Uh, creating that uh, independent group is going to be a critical step that we'll undertake in January. You know, ultimately we get our census data next year, uh, sometime in April or maybe a little bit later because the census has been so delayed. But we need to set that in motion with the new with the new council uh, come the beginning of 2021. And from my standpoint, you know, it's it's figuring out what that composition of those members is going to be, you know, making sure that it's fair as much as possible, trying to make it as independent as possible uh, so that politics isn't part of it. You know, that was what coming up with the current six districts to me was a very positive thing, having multiple plans and having ultimately a diverse community group that came with the final, the final design that we ended up with, with our six districts that we're currently having in the current election. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next topic is traffic safety. What will you do as mayor to help improve traffic and pedestrian safety in Snail and throughout the city neighborhoods? And we will start with Nancy. I am um, appalled by some of the videos that Snail, well, by the videos that Snail showed recently. I think it's very, um, um, unfortunate that, that the drivers and, the, and snail are abusing the intersections in such a way. And I don't feel that the city's process of uh, traffic calming is necessarily as transparent as it could be. Um, so for now, we are looking at enforcement um, over time. We are looking at re building our infrastructure through our Vision Zero plan and our active transportation plans. Uh, so in the short term, I think more enforcement is definitely needed. In the medium term, uh, traffic calming ASAP in some areas. And lastly, um, rebuilding the infrastructure to make it safer for bicyclists and pedestrians just by design is needed. Thank you. Michael. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I mostly agree uh, the, with what um, Council Member uh, Smith said. The, um, uh, th those were uh, terrible videos. Uh, that plays into what, one thing I was saying earlier, which is we need a police liaison commission so there's some place to go. Right now, uh, Valerie had to take that to the City Council. Uh, we're supposed to be dealing with these grand issues, but that's a, uh, that's a very specific issue and it needs to be addressed. Uh, when I first moved here, decades ago. I lived in Berkeley for about a year. And what they did was they, they basically blocked off a couple of streets in some way. So you could get in, but you couldn't go through. So you basically changed a couple of streets to sort of dead ends or cul-de-sacs. Uh, and uh, it was much calmer. Uh, traffic uh, went on to other streets, more larger streets. But if that's what we have to do, uh, that should not happen. Those videos were, were shocking. And when I talked to the city manager about it, um, he said you could talk to a certain person in charge of things. Uh, that's not really satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Sure. And I, I was definitely taken aback by the sideshow videos that, that Valerie presented to council and, and definitely DPS. And that's the biggest thing. We have seen those sideshow events 
not just in Snail, along the Wayne and other portions of the city. Most likely not even residents to some degree. But as far as improving traffic, it, safe, uh, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety in Snail, you know, there's already a project to deal with Morse. So there's currently in certain intersections that are being improved. And then, you know, what council did last month as far as the active transportation plan. And I commend, you know, Snail for, for being part of the process for advocating to make sure that, that both the BPAC as well as the Snail uh, neighborhood made their voice heard to make sure that additional improvements were done along Boregas and other portions within Snail. So for, from our standpoint, safe routes to schools, Vision Zero are a number one priority and that's part of the active transportation plan. We now need to implement it and move forward. Thank you. All right, our next topic is on communicating with the residents of Sunnyvale. How will you increase community outreach, engagement, and participation in city business, especially on top, I'll give that to you again. Let me just start in the beginning. All right, how will you increase community outreach, engagement, and participation in city business, especially on hot topics that significantly affect a neighborhood? And we'll start with Michael. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, residents, rightly, I think, feel like they don't really have a place to go to vent their complaints. Um, and uh, that's one, one thing I've proposed as an ombudsman, someone who reports directly to the city council and is responsible for following up on all these things. Right? I could spend all, I, each of one of us could spend all day, every day, answering emails and following up on uh, uh, complaints uh, about things. Uh, the other thing is, uh, other city councils do this. Uh, they they have uh, once uh, every two weeks a kind of open forum where you can have a dialogue with the city council. Right now, we're basically forbidden to interact with the people that come before us on Tuesdays. Uh, the th another thing is, we could get these um, agendas out more than three working days or four working days before the council meeting. So uh, some places do it two weeks before. Then you'd have a chance to review what's going on. Uh, talk to the city council people, uh, find out what's going on. I really, really, really want that to happen. Uh, so those are my, my, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. So from, from a council standpoint, from a mayor standpoint, for four years now, I've been doing office hours uh, at one of the local coffee shops every, every Friday, and now they're virtual, you know, making sure that dialogue with the community and being open to emails, to meetings has been a critical part of the job trying to educate people on how to use Access Sunnyvale. And there are ways to raise issues with, with the city. Uh, that being said, you know, getting information out is the second half of that. And you know, what we've done over the last two years is really create you know, list, mail, mail lists as far as getting people interested in either the ATP or the Unity events. We've, we've correct, collected hundreds of names and, and made them aware of what's going on with, with uh, reforming our public safety, going through that unity discussion. And that's the model as far as, you know, reaching out to the community. And then also the big thing about COVID-19 is we now have moved to a more virtual standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. And Nancy. I, this is my area. I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, we are running for citywide, but we will soon, very soon have um, people in districts. And I'm imagining that we can start setting up district pages that will um, allow the council member from that district and, uh, to perhaps have um, some communications with residents about air, uh, items that are coming up for each district. Also, there are many opportunities for public input. Like for instance, the high-speed rail just had a uh, EIR, and I don't know that uh, very many people in Sunnyvale knew about that. And it will impact us because of the noise of the high-speed trains. So I would like to have some sort of a clearinghouse uh, for where people can give public input. Um, and also, I do agree that uh, having more of a presence and streaming presence on uh, social media is something that we should definitely look at. Thank you. Okay. So our next topic is about seniors. So Sunnyvale has an aging population. In light of the passing of the active transportation plan, how will you support those that can't get on a bike or walk very far? 
and we will start with Larry, please. Sure. Uh, so I've been a big proponent for walkability in our communities. When I first got on council, I had a study issue to, to create a bench program and, and didn't get enough council support to, to move that study issue forward. But that's one of the critical things. You know, the, a, a senior's um, basically walkability is, is dependent upon how far they walk before they can sit down. So as they age, a lot of times their area within, the, within Sunnyvale that they can walk to continues to shrink. And so that's one of the things that we can do. You know, it's like improving, you know, our streets uh, from, from a walkability standpoint, adding, you know, spreading benches throughout the city, like was done many years ago that have kind of disappeared, is one of the things that the city can do to make it, you know, more convenient for residents, especially aging residents, to get around, to go to walk farther. And I think that's one of the, one of the critical things, you know, it's like making it more pedestrian friendly. We do focus on bikes and, and active transportation, but I think benches make a big difference. Thank you. Nancy. I, um, I took care of my father who was, um, had a stroke and was otherwise um, did, unable to get around easily. And then when Janelle, I broke my hip and couldn't get around easily. And I will tell you that uh, transporting somebody um, who cannot walk is difficult. You can use paratransit or you can pay $150 to get an ambulance to take you wherever you need to go. Uh, we do need options for our aging um, uh, and I think uh, people who can't get around. So is that um, uh, some sort of a subsidized shuttle? There's talk of maybe having um, uh, a shuttle program where um, maybe it could do other things in the community uh, when people aren't using it to shuttle employees around. So I think we need to think creatively, uh, 40%, uh, I think 30, by 2040, 30% of people will be age 65 or older in Sunnyvale, and we need to solve this. Thank you. Michael. Uh, yeah, I've been advocating um, a shuttle, local shuttle for, for since I, before I, before I became on the council, get on the council. Uh, we keep talking about it in the city council and I, I, it keeps not happening. I really, that's something I really want to push for. Um, a, a paratransit is, is fine, but it's expensive and it's, um, you know, if you're older, you have more time. You may not have much uh, energy, but you have more time. And you can, you can uh, set your schedule to be ready for the shuttle. And um, I, we can go in with Mountain View and Cupertino and get a shuttle which will serve the, uh, all three communities. It can be for getting to work in the morning and the evening uh, to and from, and it can be for getting to the parks for older people in the daytime. Uh, and a lot of, lot of uh, companies already have shows. Uh, those buses and uh, sit idle for most of the day, we could put them to use along with the drivers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next topic is about the environment. So to fulfill the goals of Sunnyvale's Climate Action Plan, Vision Zero Plan, and Active Transportation Plan, it will be expensive to implement. What programs would you support we implement in the next four years to make significant progress? And we'll begin with Nancy. We have outlined what the, the council approved and the ATP what the top priorities are. And um, it included safe routes to school, some infrastructure projects and uh, and uh, high impact areas. So I would prioritize the safe routes to school improvements, uh, assuming that uh, maybe in two weeks, uh, students will start going back to school if we stay in the red status. But, but um, we've had issues in District 4 uh, with um, crossing El Camino, and I get calls frequently about people concerned about um, crossing of uh, other streets as well. So we need to make things safer for our students firstly, and then also fix the intersections where there are accidents. So those are my two top priorities. Thank you. Larry. Sure. So you will hear it. You've heard it before and you hear it again. You know, it's the concept of electrifying everything. And from a, from a reach code standpoint, we'll hopefully finally be do, meet, meeting those goals and defining what electric buildings are 
you know, going forward. And so that's one of the critical things, you know, it's like making sure, making it as easy as possible for electric buildings, residential and office space to be built in our city, providing the appropriate EV infrastructure, you know, so, so that people that are driving uh, electric vehicles can find charging stations around the city. And in, from a fleet standpoint, from a city standpoint, it's, it's setting that example. And we finally have added, you know, our first EVs into our, into our city's fleet. You know, it's, it's making sure that we set that example and then move forward with, with providing the appropriate infrastructure. And then conceivably, the other thing is putting the appropriate investments into all active transportation. You know, the ATP that we just approved, we need to prioritize all those projects and then finding, find the appropriate city funding and grant funding to get them done. Thank you. Michael. Uh, the um, two big drivers of uh, environmental um, or greenhouse gases in Sunnyvale are buildings. That's about um, 9% of the state. And I've, I think it's a lot more here because we have more buildings. Uh, two, two thirds of that are office buildings. I've been, I proposed several times. I got, couldn't even get a second most of the time or at least another vote. Uh, to have all new commercial buildings uh, be fully electric and be have sun, uh, solar power on top um, and uh, got nowhere on that. So uh, there are other things I'd like to do. We've had bra uh, power outages. Uh, what uh, some utilities do, and we have some influence with Silicon Valley Clean Energy, is they go 50-50 or 60-40 or something with uh, residents on putting batteries in their, you know, something like a Tesla Powerwall in their house so they can last through a day or something without power or a couple hours. Uh, and then the city can draw on that for, for more power. So we're not consuming gas when the uh, lights are, are down. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next topic is about water. California will continue to face droughts. Sunnyvale is dramatically increasing the supply of recycled water as part of the WPCP upgrade. What other actions do you support Sunnyvale taking to reduce the amount of water the city needs to import to meet residents and business needs? And we'll begin with Larry. Sure. Uh, from a water standpoint, and as much as we have, you know, a lot of construction going on, all that construction actually uses less water than what was previously there. We're actually, you know, from a water standpoint, doing, you know, pretty much the levels uh, that we had back in the late 90s. And so as we continue to add, you know, office space and, and additional residential, the water, the water savings with that, you know, new equipment is actually uh, a lot better than what was there before. And as far as the wastewater treatment plant, you know, in the long run, as we're looking at finishing and we're close to finally finishing phase one of that project, when we, when we get to the end, conceivably making that recycled water potable, completely potable, so that, that it's not just being used for groundwater um, infusement, infusement or conceivably you know, to, to water plants in, in uh, green areas with, throughout the city, it ultimately can be drinkable. And so, so that's one of the long-term goals that the city can do you know, as we're finishing up the wastewater treatment plant. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah people in California, residents in California must feel a little, uh, feel they're being bounced around. They're told on one hand that we're short of water. On the other hand, they're told we're supposed to grow a whole bunch of more people in buildings. Yeah, you can absolutely can uh, cut down on the water use. That's great, and I do the, I do the same. I, I've uh, all natural garden, yard and uh, uh, low flush toilets and all that. Uh, but at some point, uh, recycled water has problems. That is, some it's basically filtered very very finely, but some molecules get through. Lithium's the most common one. That's in all the medicines. Gets flushed down the toilet. Uh, and you, uh, you ultimately will probably have, if you want to keep growing, you're going to have to go to, um, you know, re uh, getting converting seawater into fresh water, and that's going to be very expensive. I, there's a point of diminishing returns where further growth makes becomes so much more expensive, it's just not worth it. And I think we need to tell the uh, big companies, and they're already learning, hearing this. Uh, this is a big state and a big country that you can go somewhere else. Uh, if you're going to expand, stay where you are, but expand elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. Yeah, so we can focus on conservation and uh, keeping our supplies uh, safe and, um, and clean. So 
one of the things that we can look at in conservation is uh, increasing our use of um, warm water infrastructure and our, our green, I forget what they call them, but the, um, the infrastructure can be made to conserve water more. And we can also uh, promote the use of native and low water use plants and continue to work with the water district to help uh, residents to use uh, gray water more for watering their yards, uh, doing their laundry, uh, and use water more smartly. I think we've just started with that and there's a lot more conservation we can do. Thank you. All right, our next topic is on energy. How will you get PG&E to stop blackouts when places like movie theaters, concert halls, stadiums, and many office buildings are closed and dark? Why are we running out of electricity when not much electricity was drawn from the grid for the past six months? And we'll start with Michael, please. Energy is a big deal. Um, we had unprecedented heat waves. I, you know, it was um, 117 in Escondido uh, in the LA area. Uh, I was, um, you know, everyone knows how hot it got here. I've looked to the county sustainability um, organization. They're predicting in another 20 years, it'll be 100, in the 120s in Morgan Hill. Uh, we're going to be needing a lot more energy. I, that's why I come back to, I really, I keep pressing Silicon Valley clean energy. When are you going to do what um, Vermont and uh, New Hampshire are doing, which is uh, going in on uh, sharing batteries with the residents so they don't get blacked out every time PG&E or somebody decides they need to cut a line. Uh, and you can get through a day or even two days or a week uh, if you have two batteries. Uh, share the cost. They're expensive right now. They're coming down in cost. But if, PG, if uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy can share that cost, we can get through this. Also, we just need a lot more solar panels, period. Okay, stop. Thanks. Thank you. Nancy. I am on the, I'm the vice chair of the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority. And we just announced on July 30th a partnership with Sunrun to do just that. We are uh, starting a, a virtual power plant with solar and storage uh, options to help with resiliency, especially targeting low income multifamily units. So we are doing that, we just launched it. Um, another thing that we can do, um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is a community run agency that invests in clean energy production. So we are also doing solar and battery storage uh, facilities uh, throughout the region, as well as geothermal and wind resources for sustainability. So we are definitely working on energy options for the future and we conserved and avoided most of our blackouts. So yay us. Thank you. All right, and Larry, please. Sure, you know, I, I work with Mayor Licardo and a lot of mayors uh, trying to make sure that PG&E coming out of bankruptcy would ultimately conceivably go to a JPA because the worst possible thing is, you know, PG&E still provides the, the infrastructure for delivering our power. And the concept that, that whatever monies they're getting, a portion of that is going to uh, their investors isn't really good in the long run. That being said, the judge decided against dealing with that. And the power outages that we saw, you know, over the last few weeks had nothing to do directly with PG&E. It was decided at the state level. And, and they looked at the overall power grid, not just in Northern California, but across California in what those peak loads might be. And conservation was the only possibility to try to maintain or to reduce the rolling blackouts. That being said, you know, I'm, I'm completely behind conceivably creating a solar farm, you know, whether or not it's, it's, you know, in here in Sunnyvale, elsewhere in the Bay, elsewhere in the South Bay here, you know, and providing additional energy locally. Thank you. All right, our next topic is airplane noise. What will you do and what won't you do to help reduce airplane noise in our city? And we will begin with Nancy. So the city has been working to install monitors for noise um, and we will be obviously monitoring because that's what they do. Um, and we 
work with a round table of communities um, who are impacted uh, in various counties to uh, work with the FAA and present a unified voice. So uh, we, um, we need to be, uh, I guess, aware of uh, how the FAA is going to respond to the local demands for um, mitigation of the noise and to advocate in such a way strategically that Sunnyvale's um, interests are maintained and our residents are not uh, put upon by a lot of airplane noise uh, and to address the issues that we have. Thank you. Michael. Uh, we should stop doing what doesn't work. Um, the round table um, is all the local communities and they all seem to be happy with us getting a lot of airplane noise. Uh, it kind of depends on the winds, of course. Sunnyville already belongs to a um, nationwide um, kind of lobbying organization or organization of communities that suffer from this kind of problem. Uh, but we, and they, they have a lobbyist in Washington, but um, we never use them. Uh, and part of the reason is we're really not taking it seriously enough. What I have proposed before and tried to get through and never got us even a vote was an uh, airplane noise commission of volunteers, residents, who would work and try and find out, uh, join with other communities around the country, uh, use the uh, lobbying group we already are part of uh, to uh, you know, get all of us around the country, all the communities around the country to, get, to work on this. If we stick with what we're doing, we're gonna keep on getting what we're getting, which is basically nothing. The FAA won't listen to our, our decibel ratings. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Sure, you know, one of, when I was sworn in four years ago, one of the first you know, non-council events that I went to was, to was to advocate for our city up in San Mateo County for our airplane noise and the effects of airplane noise directly on our residents. And over the last four years, you know, from, from the Cities Association of, of Santa Clara County, where I'm president, you know, we kicked off the Santa Clara, Santa Cruz uh, airplane, airplane noise roundtable. And that's basically a clearinghouse for ideas, for issues, for the cities affected, as well as uh, working with our, our federal representatives, as well as the FAA. And it's having that direct communication with the FAA. You know, during one of my trips to DC uh, with the National League of Cities, you know, I was able to talk with the FAA and they were actually listening. And I think that's, that's the important thing is having that uh, area where our residents and our cities can have open communication and be aware of what's happening with the FAA regarding their gut policies and guidelines. Thank you. All right, so second to last question here. Now we'll turn to a question to provide you an opportunity to address something that we did not ask. So we will start with Michael. You'll be the first to respond. So would you please state and answer a question you wish you had been asked? Uh, that's actually hard. You've asked a lot of good questions. Uh, I would say um, we, we really didn't talk much about uh, public safety. Uh, other places like LA have already cut back 10% uh, on their public safety staffing hours. They haven't laid off anybody, but they're, they're required to take uh, one day out of 10 uh, without pay. Uh, I am opposed to that. Um, the tragedies that have happened with public safety around the other police officers in other states did not come because they had too much money. So defunding doesn't do anything. It's not the problem. The problem is the training. The problem is sensitivity. And the problem is interactions with the public. Uh, and the uh, training is good. They spend eight, a year and a half in training. Uh, the, the Public Safety Commission I suggested would be a big step forward. Uh, but I, um, the, the main thing is that we preserve our public safety. California is burning. Our firefighters are in other communities. We have to uh, keep that uh, where it is. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. Yeah, I wish I had been asked what got me started on the path to public service and leadership and who inspired me. So when I was fresh out of college, I joined the board of a food pantry that provided emergency assistance to uh, families in need with maybe a month or two of rent with um, maybe some extra food. And um, the executive director was a mentor to me and his motto uh, for the agency was err on the side of grace. 
And soon after I joined the board, um, the board hired an armed off-duty police officer to guard the lobby. And I felt this was a very bad message to the community that we were serving, one that, of distrust and prejudice. So I pushed the board to fire the uh, guard and train volunteers in conflict resolution techniques. And it worked, they listened. And so that shocked me and uh, set me on the path to leadership and public service. Thank you, and Larry. Sure, the question would be, what are you most proud of it, for your time as mayor? Now, while I've had a lot of accomplishments from getting historic Murphy Avenue closed to pedestrians only, or you know, getting $8 million plus funding to the Stevens Creek Trail, I think I'm most proud of being able to actually build community during our shelter in place from delivering masks to those in need, to connecting people sewing masks to those with the items that they need, or just my spontaneous mayor's restaurant project, you know, talking to restaurant owners and then seeing you know, our residents following the mayor's footsteps and visiting those same residents. You know, I've been Sunnyvale's counselor in chief for those that are going through very difficult times, those in need. And you know, I've been proud to, that I've actually been able to improve Sunnyvale, even during these extraordinary times. And I look forward to actually continuing that task. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so it's time for the final question. And this will be answered in a different order because we literally did another random drawing. So this one will go, first we'll hear from Michael, then we'll hear from Larry, and then we'll hear from Nancy. And without discussing, your competitor, what is the final thought or thoughts you want us to hear on why we should vote for you? And you each have 90 seconds. So, Michael. Thank you. Uh, we are in the middle of the worst medical crisis since the Spanish flu killed tens of millions around the world 100 years ago. We are at the beginning of the worst employment crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s. California is burning up uh, for, I think, the third year in a row now. Uh, and our firefighters and police are working overtime and stressed on this. Uh, Sunnyvale's revenues are projected to decline by 15% over the next two years and not get back to current levels for four years. And those are basically educated guesses. We don't really know. California has $54 billion in deficit on the state level, and they can and have taken city revenues before, and we'll probably do it soon again. Uh, so we're going to have more homelessness, more stress, and... Uh, we can't keep doing what we've been doing. We, we can't uh, go spending uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for a new civic center when uh, we, uh, we, we may be faced with layoffs when uh, a crucial city staff. If we keep on doing what we're doing, um, things are not, uh, not going to well, go well. Uh, things have changed too much. Uh, work from home may end up with a Sunnyvale population declining for the first time in, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, 150 years, something. Uh, so we, we have multiple crises to work through, and I, I think we need, I, do, I know we need new leadership because uh, the current leadership is not up to it. They were fine, uh, doing great when things were rolling along as normal, but things are not normal anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Larry. Sure. Thank you for giving me this chance to speak this evening. In 2016, I pledged to listen to the community and get things done. And for the past four years, I've worked to listen, educate, and collaborate with hundreds of residents, young and old, during my weekly office hours, and to make a positive change in our city. As Sunnyvale's mayor for the last 20 months, I've tackled the challenges of a hate crime, the current pandemic, and racial unrest. And I'm best prepared to fill that role as mayor and continue actively working for a community during the recovery. As Sunnyvale's mayor, I pledge to continue to listen, to lead our city through that recovery, and to advocate for all of our members. Sunnyvale's diversity is our strength. And as our mayor, I will continue to fight and support to protect all of our many diverse community members that make our city great. Please allow me to continue to serve you and fight for your values and your vision. You know, I'm proud of the work that I've done for our residents over the last four years. And I'm happy to have the support of many community leaders like Diane McKenna, Larry Stone, Ron Gonzalez, and many, many more. You know, I hope that I've earned your vote and support tonight. You know, I, I've been trying to make Sunnyvale a better place to live. Please see LarryForMayor.com to learn more about me, my campaign, and join my team. 
Thank you for your consideration. Please stay safe. And of course, wear a mask. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Nancy. In my opening statements, I mentioned that people come first in my policy decisions. Like you, I've had friends or family members that have been injured or even killed in bicycle and pedestrian accidents. That is why I am the council member who has prioritized safety above all else. Like you, I've had family members who have, or friends who've had to move out of the area because they cannot afford to stay here. That is why I'm the council member who pushed for a statewide housing production platform. Like you, I want our community to have opportunities for families to spend time together, to play together, and to enjoy all that Sunnyvale has to offer. That's why I did not stop until we had a seasonal ice rink in downtown Sunnyvale. Many of us are worried about climate change and want to do something proactive. That's why I pushed for federal, continued federal funding for the electrification of Caltrain. And as a member of the board of Silicon Valley Clean Energy, I have approved millions of dollars to help shift people to low emission options like heat pump water heaters. If you envision, as I do, a Sunnyvale for all, a Sunnyvale that's livable and sustainable, and want a mayor who puts people first, please make me your choice and vote Nancy Smith for mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that does conclude our questions for this evening. I just want to take a moment and thank each of the candidates, and I'm going to list them in uh, in alphabetical order. So Michael Goldman, Larry Klein, and Nancy Smith, we so appreciate your time. This was very, very informative. So thank you so much. I'm going to pull up the, the slides now. And so um, we'll wave goodbye. And remember to go check their websites. All right. So check, check out their websites, learn more about the candidates. Uh, once again, Michael Goldman, Larry, and Nancy Smith. So big thank you to our candidates and a really big thank you to Snail. Thank you so much for hosting this. Thank you to my league volunteers that helped put this forum on. And thank you for attending this evening. We appreciate your time. Please remember to vote on or before November 3rd. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we are doing candidate forms for each of the districts and we will be doing one on the ballot measures themselves, um, explaining the pros and the cons of those measures. If you go to our website at lwvcs.org, we will have our calendar there. You can find out more about those and we'll put the recordings on that as well. We will also send out uh, the link to the recordings as soon as we have them in the next few days. So that's, that is a wrap. I'm going to leave you with the nonpartisan election information. So once again, take a moment to either screenshot it, take a photo, jot it down, whatever works for you. But it's, it's a, a, it's a, wonderful list of many, many fact-checked websites. So thank you again for attending. Bye-bye.